All right, so this is a joint work with uh, NTS and uh, Petersburg University. Um, all the calculations were done by uh, the Misha's team. Um, and it, it, these are all new results. Uh, some ideas are not new, but um, I'm uh, pushing them. Um, we're trying to decide whether we can write a paper from this, so any comments uh, will help us decide. <clears throat> so we're doing more and more simulations of uh, airframe noise, you know, flaps, uh, slats, landing gear, and all that, and uh, trying to uh, calculate accurately the far field noise using the Fox Rims Hawking's um, integral equation. Um, and in particular, a question that comes up at Boeing all the time and in the workshops and all that is the use of um, solid uh, surfaces. Well, we're looking for solid uh, sound sources like, say, the wheel or the door of the landing gear. And then that's a question of the integral we're using. So um, right away, I'll go to the equation and then I guess go to the outline after the equation. You all know um, uh, this equation that gives the far field uh, sound pressure uh, from uh, a volume integral of quadrupoles and then two surface integrals of dipoles. And uh, this equation is exact, but how well do we use it? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, so this is really a as discussed by somebody yesterday, post-processing uh, turbulence resolving simulation to the far field. So we do a DES and LES, something, uh, you know, unsteady and three-dimensional, and then um, use the, the equation to calculate the far field sound. So the questions I'm asking today are not the same as, there have been many papers about the physics of the sound source, you know, or quadrupoles a real source of sound. Uh, here it's more uh, practical. If we have a good enough unsteady simulation, how well do we, uh, can we calculate the far field noise? Um, now, there have been almost no papers where people did a volume integral. So we usually only have uh, surface integrals, but the surface can be the solid surface, say of the landing gear, or permeable surface that surrounds the turbulence and then quadrupoles that are inside it are captured. So uh, by moving the surface, making it permeable, uh, a lot of this contribution goes into uh, the surface integral. But 90% of the people prefer using the solid surface uh, because it's easier, and I've been arguing against that for a while. Um, <clears throat> A lot of it is based on a 1955 paper by Curl uh, and his low Mach number theory. He said at low Mach numbers, uh, the surf solid surface terms are stronger than the turbulence uh, quadrupole terms, and so we can do that. But Curl didn't say, what is a low Mach number? Is it an airplane or is it a submarine? Uh, the other thing is that to do a good job with a permeable surface, you need to place it uh, still in the fine grid region because uh, the simulation will lose the high frequencies as the grid gets coarser. So designing uh, the permeable surface is not easy. And the other thing is in external flows, uh, the turbulence is going to cross the permeable surface at, at the downstream end which is violating the assumptions. It means that if you are, we're neglecting uh, the quadrupoles uh, downstream uh, of the, our surface, and so we're doing something that, you know, we need to verify that it's, um, it's not too bad. Okay, so my questions today are, um, they, m many of them go back to a paper I had uh, five years ago in JSV about the acoustic analogies, you know, light tails and curls uh, at low Mach numbers. And so the big question is for airframe noise, say flaps, slats, uh, flap edges, landing gear, cavities, all of these things we're working on hard. Um, 
is a solid surface uh, integral sufficient? And so this is something we're very interested in. The engines are now quieter, so the noise of the landing gear has become uh, quite a bit more important. And since we're right now designing an airplane, we may be flying for 50 years. Uh, we uh, really need to get ahead. Um, and currently at Boeing, we hope to have a flight test next year with some ideas of uh, noise reduction. <coughs> so, and one thing that people in the field, you know, in technology would like to know is to find out which part of the airplane is making the most noise. Maybe this brace is making more noise, or the disc brakes, or the landing gear door. And that's the Fox Wims Hawking's integral allow us to uh, figure that out. And so some people think it's self-evident to um, go to the surface integral and then take um, the part of the surface integral that is coming, say, from here and say, oh, this tells me what the noise is of this part of the airplane. And um, I think I'm going to show that it's, uh, it can be misleading. It's a dangerous uh, thing to do. Uh, now, I don't know how much this uh, thinking is prevalent, say, outside Boeing. Um, I asked somebody at Onera, and he, he thought, oh, yeah, yeah, people here also will think that. Uh, and of course, if you look at a part of an airplane and you see the pressure fluctuations are very strong on it, you can tell that it's making noise. Uh, but is the approach of separating the integrals really quantitative or not? So I'd like to know that. And to explore this, uh, we're going to use three model problems. One is a dipole under a sphere, and then two fuselages, one with a cavity, the other with a bluff body. Um, we simplified the geometry considerably relative to this so we could have faster and more accurate results. Um, but people at Boeing at NASA currently are doing simulations with uh, very complete geometries. Are, are they grid converged? That's another question. Oh, yeah, I have some uh, citations from uh, Crichton's uh, 75 review paper. And um, he was commenting here on uh, uh, Curl's paper, and he said, when the surface is no, non-compact, no general result can be drawn from the solution. Um, and in particular, one strange thing Curl did is he said, we're going to make three approximations. And the first one is that the observer distance is large compared with the size of the landing gear. Yeah, that's fine. And the second one is the observer distance is large compared with the wavelength. And then that's fine. And the third one is that the landing gear is compact. And he made it sound like, yeah, one, two, three, no problem. But we're very interested in frequencies like a kilohertz. This is a wavelength, and it's not large compared with the size of the landing gear. And so a lot of people in the field uh, believe uh, curls uh, scaling law with a mark to the sixth power, but it would apply if the wavelength were much larger than the size of the device. <coughs> and uh, this is a work done uh, for, in collaboration with Boeing by uh, Professor Wolf and uh, Stur Ricciardi in uh, Brazil. And uh, the St. Louis group is the one that's doing complex uh, simulations. So you can see this uh, nose landing gear here has uh, pretty complete geometry. Um, and I kept telling them, well, show me that your surface integral is, uh, you know, is accurate. And so I convinced them to do, to uh, apply the formula for an observer that is uh, down at uh, negative 100 uh, units, and then for an observer that is up above the airplane. And what you find is that the um, integral gives almost exactly the same result. And now you know that the landing gear, especially the cavity, the noise is not going up to the sky uh, the way it is going down to the ground. So this tells you that 
something is wrong. Um, and Wolf is starting to agree with me on that. Um, and one thing that happens is if you look at the cavity, it's like a shoebox, and you have pressure fluctuations on the surface, and then you apply the function talking's formula, it doesn't know whether the air is inside the shoebox and moving around, or is the air outside the shoebox and radiating sound. And so uh, I, I think that's a simple way to explain why the solid surface formula uh, can uh, basically miss the directivity of the sound. Um, so, so to me, uh, this is a, a paradox that it's starting to alert us that something's probably wrong with the solid surface calculations. Okay, so the, this was in my uh, JSV paper. I call it a gentle reminder. Um, so Curl correctly showed that at very low Mach numbers and using the time derivative of the force on a compact body, the dipole sound was of order Mach number to the sixth power. <clears throat> and then he says, well, we know from Lytle that the quadrupole is of order m to the eighth power. Uh, therefore, we have an approximation that is of second order in m. Right. And Curl really wrote that in his paper. But the reality is that the pressure is a direct sum of the dipole and quadrupole term, and then there's a cross term. And um, this cross term is going to be of order n to the seventh power. So what this means is that if you have dipoles, then neglecting the quadrupoles is only a first order approximation. And this cross term of order n to the seventh could be of either sign, and I will show uh, mostly cases where they are, it's, it's negative, that is, it's going to reduce the, uh, the amplitude. Um, and I remember all of these uh, scalings with Mach number are only for compact sources, and I've already showed that, shown that our sources are not really compact. <clears throat> okay, so the, f the first model problem is a dipole under a sphere. So we have an oscillating force uh, and uh, so that could be, it, it could be a wheel that has vortex shedding and is, has an oscillating force. And so the people who believe in partial integrals would say, I just need to calculate uh, the sound created by this oscillating force and I, I know what I'm doing. Um, so this would amount to applying Curl's uh, theory of compact sources to it. Um, but now we're solving this in, in the presence of a large solid body, which is like having the landing gear wheels under a fuselage. And this is what the sound field looks like for the uh, frequency we picked. Uh, so the dipole is here, it's a black dot, and uh, you see the sponge layers. Uh, but the sound uh, radiated down has pretty strong uh, interference patterns. Uh, which depend on the wavelength. Um, and then the sound going uh, up above the sphere is much, much weaker. So the question is, are, are, are the integrals going to reproduce that? So we're going to apply Foxwim's Hawking's uh, three ways. Uh, the dipole only, the dipole and the sphere surface, and this figure shows the uh, integron of the surface term on the sphere, then a permeable surface. Uh, we're using a near field utility uh, courtesy of uh, Dubin and Kozubskaya. Uh, we've worked a lot with the far field version, but uh, they uh, provided one that does even uh, near field, uh, which is really essential so we can compare the results of the formula with the true velocity and pressure field of the simulation. Um, so the results are a little complicated. <clears throat> um, so this part is the uh, sound going down to the ground. This one is up. And so, so the from CFD means it's a real simulation itself. So this uh, magenta curve has the interference I talked about. 
and then it's much weaker uh, going up. Um, if we use the permeable uh, surface with different uh, size uh, domains, then we get almost an exact result, which shows that the Foxstream's Hawking's is accurate and the simulation is also accurate, that they, they agree. Um, and then the black curve is just a dipole, a free space, it's analytic. And so it, uh, it, this black curve is very strong down. It's also almost as strong up, except uh, the distance is a little larger. And the red curve, uh, solid means uh, the sphere uh, term. And so if you look uh, up, these two are almost equal, and they, they should cancel. And so this shows that um, the dipole itself is, of course, uh, very inaccurate. And once we um, uh, combine the two, we get the uh, dashed uh, orange curve, and then it's, it's accurate. So in this um, situation, we have success with um, what I would call all the solid surface uh, terms uh, <clears throat> and they agree with the permeable and they agree with the simulation. And that makes sense because there are no quadrupoles. Um, but it's reminding us that the dipole by itself is uh, definitely not correct. So the uh, second model problem is a cavity. And um, of course, uh, after the Brazilian work and other Boeing work, I was really interested in showing that the, trying to isolate the noise of the cavity was going to uh, be really uh, misleading. Um, so we have a simulation at Mach uh, 0.25, pretty large. Um, cylinder, uh, I mean the diameter Reynolds number. It's uh, DES and the, uh, most of the body is in unsteady RANS mode and the grid is not very fine. And then the cavity and the uh, turbulence that flows from it are in the DES mode. <clears throat> and so the question we're asking, what is the sound of that cavity? And so we'll apply Fox Wims Hawking's three ways. Uh, cavity only, so the most naive, and then all solid surfaces, and then permeable surfaces. And we have two uh, permeable surfaces that are nested, and that allows us to calculate, well, first of all, to compare the two, which is always a good test, and second of all, to uh, calculate um, the sound field generated by the inner surface at some uh, test points on the outer one. I'll show one of these results. Um, and, and then, of course, we can compare with the true sound of the simulation because the surface is still in the fine grid region. And so, as expected, the noise is uh, centered uh, at the cavity. Uh, there's a Doppler effect. Um, and, uh, and then some noise is generated by the, the turbulence that keeps uh, bouncing on the, on the body. Um, and of course, the noise uh, above the fuselage is uh, much weaker. Uh, this figure has, has gives pretty much the same, uh, the same message. Okay, so the first thing we did is to calculate with a permeable surface and compare with the true sound of the simulation, and they agree. It's this figure here. So we have very good agreement between the DES direct result and the Foxstream Hawking uh, result. Um, that point 14 was just under uh, the cavity. Um, and then here, we're gonna compare the sound up and down, and they're quite different. Uh, there is uh, more than 10 decibels, uh, getting close to 20. Uh, not that strong, uh, not as much a difference. There's still about 10 decibels, 
uh, for the low frequencies. Um, what's maybe interesting is that the low frequencies, they seem to be just um, a carbon copy of each other with just that, uh, that difference. And then for higher frequencies, uh, things are more um, uh, are truly different. So, and then we look at uh, solid only for swims Hawkins. And what we find is that for the higher frequencies, there's almost no difference. So if you compare it with this, which had at least 15 decibels, uh, clearly something is wrong with the high frequencies. Um, what we are having a little more trouble explaining is why the low frequencies up to a number of about four uh, seem to be uh, doing pretty well um, because it's, it's still not compact uh, for this. Uh, well, at least the, the whole uh, fuselage with a diameter of one is not compact at a strong number of four. Maybe the cavity is. <clears throat> oh yeah, this is a check of interest. Um, we looked at the sound inside the permeable surface and uh, I have some colleagues at Boeing that don't really understand Fox Wind Hawkins and I said, well, you know, you have the heavy side function so it should give zero inside the surface. And it doesn't give exactly zero but it's down uh, as soon as you go inside the surface. It's down by almost uh, 30 decibels. Um, and what my colleague also was wondering is what would happen uh, where the uh, hard body is, the solid surface at plus or minus 0 0.5, and nothing happens. Um, everything with Fox Wim's Hawkins is about being inside or outside the surface, that your permeable surface. So, th so this was really uh, reassuring. You know, almost 30 decibels is a good, uh, good tolerance. So we're still working on the cavity on the fuselage. And um, so here uh, on the left, I'm showing the noise up. And on the right, the noise down. And again, what we're finding is that, um, this is just showing the same result, is that the solid surface is accurate up to about four for Struhal number. And then uh, it, it's inaccurate. We get the fact that the two red curves are almost the same. And so the, for the higher frequencies, uh, it's um, completely missing the shielding uh, due to the fuselage. Um, but that this quadruple effect starts only around uh, four uh, in Struhal number. Um, and even if you look at uh, Struhal number times Mach number, then uh, here it's four times 0 0.25, and one is not much smaller than one. Um, so this is something we still uh, are working on. <clears throat> and now if you really uh, strictly look at the sound attributed to the cavity, um, so that's uh, it's a red. So, uh, and you compare it with a true sound, again, it's very uh, uh, misleading because basically it, if you think of the cavity as a shoe box the formula doesn't know if the turbulence is inside the box or outside the box it just knows that there are pressure fluctuations on that box and uh, so I think that explains pretty well why um, the, uh, this partial integral just doesn't work so now to the third model problem I'm going to have a lot of time for questions. Um, so it's a bluff body under a fuselage, and we made it just uh, a kind of break. That's what Andre uh, Travin uh, picked. And uh, it's at the <clears throat> distance from the body that's comparable with what the wheel would be. Um, and so again, the simulations uh, have the same Mach number and Reynolds number. And um, the fuselage is in unsteady uh, Reynolds mode, so just smooth uh, Reynolds uh, modeled uh, turbulence. And then the bluff body is in uh, DES mode, and you can see uh, 
the vortex decontours um, show what you'd expect from um, separation from the sharp edges and then turbulence uh, down. <coughs> and um, this is a picture of the sound. Um, again, we, we have sponge regions, so it, uh, we're you know, focusing uh, much closer to the body where the grid is still fine. And uh, the sound, of course, is much less uh, regular than what we had when we had a dipole with just a single frequency. Uh, but you get a similar effect that the fuselage is shielding uh, the uh, upward direction uh, from the sound. Um, and I think the sound wave series are fairly similar to what we had in the, uh, with, the, with the cavity. Um, <clears throat> but this is going to have more uh, quadrupoles uh, that are uh, farther away from the body, and you see them here. And, and here you see that uh, we're going to close the permeable surface around here, and so we do obviously have uh, turbulence coming out of it, uh, and therefore quadrupoles. So uh, we are uh, considering that the turbulence has become weak enough not to be a serious problem. These are the two uh, nested permeable uh, surfaces, uh, very similar, maybe even exactly the same ones as before. <clears throat> okay, so here we're looking at the sound uh, first uh, downward, and um, the sound just for the... <clears throat> okay, we're uh, using calculating the sound from uh, both the bluff body and the fuselage uh, combined, and they, it agrees quite well with the permeable sound, and we checked that the permeable sound was accurate. Uh, the only uh, region is, uh, so for shallow angle, so forward, the forward sound, uh, for some reason, is uh, underestimated by the solid uh, formula. Uh, but it does pretty well overall uh, for the sound towards the ground. So now we're looking up and again testing with all uh, solid surfaces. And now what you find is that the sound is strongly overestimated by uh, the solid surfaces. So what this means is that the quadrupole sound is canceling the solid surface sound and the real sound is much, uh, much smaller. So there is the, this negative correlation, and I will have figures of that, that I was talking about for that nominally mark to the seventh power term, but uh, these are not compact frequencies, so it, it's not really... Uh, uh, we're not expecting a clear scaling with mark six or seven or eight. Um, and we're back uh, looking down, and... We're looking at the sound of the bluff body only. So this is what, you know, a Boeing engineer might say, well, should I change the brick? Uh, is the sound, is the noise coming from the brick? And by changing the brick, can I change everything? And what we find is that the uh, noise from just the bluff body, just the brick, uh, in many directions is strongly underestimated. Uh, at 90 degrees, it's not bad, but you know, these are large scales, so in some, in much of this uh, spectrum, it's still close to 10 decibels uh, of error. Um, here we have summarized the sound power level uh, in the upward and uh, downward direction. And so in the upward direction, again, the accurate sound from this um, permeable formula uh, is much smaller, uh, much lower than the sound from uh, either the bluff body, but especially if you combine. Um, so most of the solid surface sound is coming from the fuselage, but it, it is spurious. The accurate sound is much lower than that. Um, in the downward direction, it's uh, the opposite. The, solid surface uh, calculation underestimates the sound 
and in some regions by more than five decibels. Um, and so the difference between uh, solid all walls and permeable, we call that uh, quadruple effect. And in the next figure, this is how I will define the quadruple sound. And uh, <clears throat> in, in some regions, we'll find that the uh, solid and the quadruple essentially uh, cancel each other. Uh, and it, it's very selective. Okay, so this is uh, the figure I was announcing uh, about that um, correlation uh, between... <clears throat> okay, so... Yeah, so the orange uh, P prime square is the, is the full signal. Uh, the green is a dipole. The blue is a quadrupole is uh, quite strong and the both uh, positive of course you remember these were square terms um, <clears throat> but now the cross term uh, between dipole and quadrupole sound it's very strong and negative and so uh, the result is that the orange sound is much much smaller than if you were to add up a dipole and quadrupole and in fact the correlation coefficient between uh, P prime dipole and P prime quadrupole is negative 0.96. They completely cancel. Um, and you go from minus 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 13. Um, so this uh, cross term that I pointed out in my paper here is extremely strong. Um, in the downward direction, the effect is not quite as strong. The correlation coefficient is still negative, but only uh, negative 0 0.37. Um, but we still have the same effect that the, um, and especially there's some bursts where the, the cross term is extremely, uh, has some strong uh, spikes. Um, oh yeah, I forgot to show that we, we also had the average, uh, the time average of each of the terms in the same color. So um, this confirms that the, the, the cross term can be very strong and um, many people just neglect it. Um, so this is a separate issue. It's another thing I've been trying to um, argue with the community about is um, these uh, simulations um, and the application of the 3D fox swims hawkings to periodic flow fields. Um, so at many workshops and, uh, the, you know, we, we saw some talks yesterday uh, with this, people do airfall simulations with uh, periodic conditions and often a pretty narrow slice like a tenth of the cord. Um, and then people apply Foxman Hawkins to the slice of the surface, whether it's solid or permeable. And so the, if you have a permeable surface, it, it looks like this, you know, the surface uh, with uh, yellow uh, or gold uh, lines. And then people are going to integrate uh, using the 3D formula, just like if they had a turbulence that is surrounded by this surface on all sides, but it's surrounded only in the XY plane. And then they just stop the integral in the Z direction. Um, so that produces an apparent sound field, but this has nothing to do with the real sound field of the simulation. The sound field from that 3D Foxman's Hawking decays like one over R. In the real flow, it decays like one over square root of R. So there's no way this approach is going to agree with a true sound field of the simulation. Uh, so that disturbs me. Um, now people have corrections for length, uh, and so then they go and they will compare with an experiment that had maybe uh, five spans uh, between the walls and all that. What disturbs me is that many people in the community don't even know that this is complete violation using 3D Fortune's Hawkins for a flow that is periodic. It's just plain wrong. Um, what is needed would be a periodic version, and I, I don't have one. I've 
I can't say I've tried uh, yet. Uh, Law Court has a 2D version of Fox Holmes Hawkins, but not a periodic. Um, <clears throat> in, a, in any case, if we had this periodic version, this would give you the true sound of the simulation that you could compare with a directly computed sound. But a comparison with a finite spine experiment would still be uh, quite arbitrary, you know, comparing the sound of a slice of airfoil to the uh, full wing is, uh, is really risky. So uh, to summarize, um, the Fox Room Talking's integral is an essential, a great part of our far field sound calculations, and more and more people are going to be doing unsteady simulations uh, where the turbulence is simulated pretty well, and uh, so it's, uh, I think, say, landing gear noise. Uh, we have a good chance of doing a good job of calculating it, although, of course, um, now we're going to have uh, uh, <coughs> reflections and diffractions and all these things. Uh, so uh, the noise of a landing gear installed under a wing is uh, much more complicated than the noise of a landing gear just under a flat plate. Um, now, the, we're finding that comparison with the simulation in the near field uh, is good, so we're confident. Uh, we know that properly closing the surface is delicate, but uh, it seems that the airframe noise is not as sensitive as a jet noise to that, that problem. Um, here I have in italic a remark, which is that uh, those simulations are not grid converged as of today. Simulations with a flap, landing gear, and these things. Uh, were, it, it's going to be years before we uh, really have, you know, very good resolution of these flow fields. Um, so I believe too many people at all the workshops take the easy solution of including only solid surfaces. And, you know, often they show figures where the agreement is pretty good, like, oh, it's only 10 decibels. Um, well, I think 10 decibels is a really bad disagreement. Um, so I believe the quadruples cannot be neglected. We call them Mark 7 scaling. Uh, we have a little bit of a mystery uh, in terms of physics, why the solid surface uh, seems to do well for up to about a uh, strong number of four. Um, another thing I've been arguing with people about is um, often people are looking at the wall pressure fluctuations so, and these are hydrodynamic, and I think this should be shown on linear axis. But because it's noise, people go to log axis, and then you can hide a lot of things. Um, so I think if you're simulating turbulence, you should be hoping for accuracy of, say, better than 10%, not better than a factor of 10. Um, so separating parts of the aircraft can be misleading, as you know, we've, we found. Um, the paradoxes are often related to shielding, but shielding really matters. Um, and it's too bad, because there would be great value in technology in identifying the dominant source. If we want to improve a landing gear, which part should we modify, or which part should we put a screen uh, in front of? <laughs> so our future plans for this study is uh, varying Mach number, hoping to confirm this Mach number 678 scaling maybe only at the lowest frequencies. Um, we're probably going to do a simulation without the fuselage, just with that bluff body, uh, try and simplify as much as possible so we can uh, have good numerical accuracy. Um, so if the feedback we get at this conference is good, uh, we'll look at writing a paper. Uh, if people say, oh, we know that, Philippe, um, or it's wrong, then maybe we won't write a paper. Okay, so thank you very much.